we look at life and transition survey data on 29 transition countries. Most importantly, at the, uh, uh, on the round uh, three, which was administered in 2015-16. So uh, this was the first round of this life and transition survey. Life and transition survey is a project administered by World Bank and the BRD. Uh, it was first uh, run in 2006. The second round was in 2010. In the, and uh, the third uh, round uh, was um, in 2015-16. Actually, in 2006, it was initiated exactly because there was a feeling that even though in macroeconomic terms, reforms have been successful, in uh, uh, po po political terms, the backlash was already felt. And the first round already showed that people don't like the reforms. Majority of people don't like the reforms, even in countries where reforms delivered. And so this uh, round in 2015-16 was unusual because we included height. So we actually asked people about their height. For a subgroup of people, we even measured height. Uh, and uh, uh, we saw that there is no systematic bias uh, across cohorts or genders uh, between measured and self-reported height. So we will use self-reported height. So why we need height? Because height is a good measure of deprivation in your first uh, couple of years of lives. So if a cohort is born in uh, 1991 or 1992, then uh, 16 years later or 20 years later, 25 years later, uh, you can actually see if this cohort is shorter or taller, that is a measure of how society was shocked uh, uh, when this cohort was born. And 2016 was kind of the first round of flits, the first survey when it was time to look at this issue because transition started in some countries in 89, but in some countries in 95. Uh, and in that sense, it was the first time when we could actually look at adult height of transition cohorts. So this is what we do here. Uh, we also look at uh, life satisfaction and attitudes. And on life satisfaction and attitudes, we look at people who were born in transition, but we also look at people who were in their what's called formative years during the transition. Formative years is the age 18 to 25, when your attitudes are formed. And it's been shown that, for example, people who were in their formative years during recessions, they are more pro-redistribution, uh, more risk averse, and so on. And so what, what we do, we look, we look at those cohorts as well. So what we find is, and this is the most important finding, is this one centimeter result. So if you're born when the transition starts or when you're one year old, if transition starts or two years old, you are going to grow up and uh, remain one centimeter shorter than your older or younger peers, okay? And uh, this shows that these countries did have a huge um, deprivation around the time of the transition. And uh, this, is, this is a very, very important result because 1%, uh, sorry, one centimeter is a huge number. So it's comparable to being born in a war. So when your country is at war, I'll show you these results. Uh, it's also the same uh, order of magnitude. So it's, it's, it's a very painful experience to be uh, in transition. Now, interestingly, when we look at wh whether these people are happier or unhappier, uh, we see that these people grow up happier. They are actually better educated. And uh, th these people did have opportunities. So people who suffered are mostly their parents who couldn't really feed them. But once these people grew up, they uh, uh, were uh, accessing more opportunities and the, are today happier. Now, there is a lot of heterogeneity of, uh, of results on height and life satisfaction. And uh, there's something I'm, talk I'm going to talk about. And uh, the impact was most painful for more vulnerable households, more vulnerable families. So in that sense, in that sense, um, uh, we shouldn't be surprised, okay? and. Uh, Finally, I'll talk about, um, about uh, formative years. Uh, results on formative years are generally weak. And the reason for that is the formative period is reasonably long. And so it's very hard to um, pinpoint uh, cohorts which, uh, which are 
are affected by transition. So formative years is a seven year period while the birth is uh, zero, one, two, is just two years, which is easier to pinpoint. Now, this is a chart which shows you the average height. So basically this is the average height in our data set for men and women. And uh, basically zero here is the year of transition. And the scale here is when you were born. So minus 60 is when you're born 60 years before transition started. For the purposes of this paper, we measured the start of transition is the year when you have price liberalization, okay? And um, uh, so you, here, as you see, we have cohorts born after transition. The standard errors here are much higher because the cohorts born after transition, say eight years after transition are fewer because uh, to be born after transition and being 18 years old, by the time we run the survey in 2015-16, you only need to be born in countries which started transition in 89 or 1990, which means only a few countries, okay? So most of the sample are people born before transition or right after transition. And here you see that there is a trend. So if you're born in 50s, you're shorter than if you're born in 70s, and that's normal. Uh, and that is true in all countries. I'll show you some graphs. If country is developing, until it's a high income country, you have higher, uh, you have taller and taller people because quality of life improves, okay? And there is a trend, but then there is a shock before, uh, right before transition. So if you're born three or two, one years before, your height suddenly goes down and then it recovers pretty much back to the trend. So if you look at the trend, you see that it's, there is a shock. And the same you can see in terms of uh, height of women, you also see a trend and then suddenly you have stagnation and decline. And then it recovers back to the trend. So that was a shock uh, during transition. And if you want to take uh, away something from this paper, this is something you should remember. This is how painful transition was. And these are raw data. And I'll show you regressions where we control for lots of stuff and still we'll find this one centimeter. Now, this is uh, the detrended graph. So what I do, I uh, merge these two things and I control for the gender. And uh, then I show you what happened if you start say 15 years before, uh, before uh, transition, you see until up to minus four or minus three years, you see no difference. The effect becomes significant in minus two years. So if you are two year old when transition started, you're likely to be half a centimeter shorter. If you are born when transition started, you are one centimeter shorter than uh, the deep trended predicted uh, height. And then there is a recovery. There is kind of a second dip, interestingly, but it's uh, the standard errors are become very large. It's hard, hard to differentiate it, but then it's a recovery. So this is, this is this, the deep trended story. And you see that indeed there is a huge decline, one centimeter decline. Okay, so let me now see if there are questions. Uh, I don't. I, I see that in chat there are no questions. But if there is, there is an immediate uh, need to ask a question, I guess you can raise your hand right now. Yanis will see that, and you can ask a question. Okay. No. Okay. If not, uh, let me go ahead. Um, so uh, literature is uh, abundant on how adult height is driven by various shocks. Now, I should tell you that 80% of your height variation is driven by your parents, by genetics, 20% by external conditions. However, if you think about variation within a society, within a population, then of course it's mostly driven by external shocks because genetics in similar groups are similar. And uh, the vast majority of variation across cohorts, within cohorts uh, by socioeconomic status, it's all driven by economic economic variables. And there are studies which show how, for example, you have a pension reform, so your family is becoming poorer, so your grandkids will grow up short, shorter. There is a paper which I like because it's a paper on Russia, published a couple of years ago in, uh, ago in American Economic Review by Markevich and Jurovska. This paper shows that when uh, Russia abolished serfdom, uh, it increased productivity and living standards to the extent that sol soldiers, Russian soldiers, Russian draftees, 
and that, that's the only population in Russia which was measured, right? So this population which was measured when they were drafted to the army, uh, that population was also one centimeter shorter. So one centimeter is uh, how much served them, uh, sorry, not shorter, taller. So uh, when serfdom was removed, uh, Russian soldiers became one centimeter taller. So one centimeter is the cost of serfdom, cost of living standards uh, declined due to serfdom. So um, this is um, a typical uh, demographic uh, chart. So it's case Paxson uh, paper uh, more than 10 years ago. They show that if you look at the US, then the most important volatility and growth um, uh, velocity in centimeters per year happens in the first uh, two years of life. There is then also adolescent growth spurt in about 12, 14 years. Uh, we actually find no, no evidence for transition effect in this people. But uh, this chart shows you why it is important to look at the first two years of life. Now, there are lots of stuff which shows you that if you're taller, you're more likely to be better educated, you're more likely to earn more income in developed countries. Uh, you're also more likely to be self-confident. However, I should tell you that this, of course, is driven by the fact that people who are taller are people who are more likely to have been born in a richer family when you look at the US, for example. So you shouldn't be surprised that you have better education, have higher income. What we are going to see in our studies, study is you're born in the wrong time, but your life is going to happen in the right time. And so we'll show you that if you're born in transition, you're going to be shorter, but your schooling attainment will actually be better. So this is, this is going to be very different from this literature. Why? Because uh, we show that transition is a very, very special episode. Okay, so uh, on uh, regarding life satisfaction. So as I said, impressionate or formative years are very important. And I mentioned those papers on risk aversion and uh, redistribution preferences. So we do this analysis too. And uh, this is not uh, the most important part of our paper, but it's an important part and I'll talk about that. Now, the survey. So it's a life and transition survey which covers all transition countries. The 2016 round covers 50,000 households in post-communist countries and five comparative countries, which are Cyprus, Greece, Germany, Italy, and Turkey. Okay. Why these countries? Cyprus, Greece, and Turkey are EBRD operations country. Germany and Italy are true comparators. So we wanted to have uh, countries which, uh, uh, which are developed so we can compare post-communist countries. Now, uh, sometimes I mentioned 30 post-communist countries, sometimes 29. Why? Because Turkmenistan didn't like leads. Turkmenistan told us uh, you're not going to run around and ask uh, citizens of Turkmenistan what they think. And so this survey was not administered in Turkmenistan. So if you look at the map, uh, there, is, there is a, Turk a gap. Uh, we didn't survey, uh, we actually didn't survey Turkmenistan. Uh, but uh, these are the, this is the map. The, all other transition countries, including Mongolia, which is also a BRD country of operation. Well, BRD, as you know, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, yet Mongolia is part of operations. Uh, still, so we looked at Mongolia, but we also, as I said, looked at Germany, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey. Okay. So uh, we also run a number of regressions using a special survey in uh, Russia called uh, RLMS, Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey. This study is very interesting because it traces some same families over time. And so we can do stuff in Russia, which we cannot do for the whole LITS survey. And we basically also can look at the height of mothers, not just height of kids. And I'll show you some results. Uh, most of our uh, results will be coming from this multi-country survey which is one of survey, but we'll also look at the panel, which is one country survey, but uh, run over time. Now, one of the things I promised you was how height and GDP are related. And basically I should tell you that in developed countries or, or on, in non-transition countries, let's put it this way, in non-transition countries, uh, when uh, GDP is growing, height is also growing until 
GDP reaches some kind of high income level. And this is true if you look at the literature, height increases with income until you become a high income country. Once you are a high income country, it starts to stagnate. And here we put a quadratic trend and you see that the tra uh, trend starts to stagnate at some level of uh, 25, $30,000 uh, per capita. Uh, and this is, when, uh, this is when it starts to stagnate. Okay, so as I mentioned, we look at uh, countries which started transition different times. Uh, we look at those 29 countries which uh, started price liberalization different times. Some of them uh, liberalized prices in 1990, some in 1995. And our identification strategy is based on this different diff. So we will look at people born, people of the same age, but, uh, but uh, since they were different age when transition started because they live in different countries, we'll find different results. Okay, so uh, how we use how we pinpoint price liberalization year? Well, EBRD has those transition indicators which range from one to four point three. One means uh, command economy, four point three means four plus, uh, means market economy, and basically for six dimensions of reforms, EBRD economies would rank countries, and when uh, we see that uh, price liberalization indicator shifts significantly. That's when we think about uh, price liberalization year. Basically, it's a change from one to three in terms of price liberalization. And most of our regressions will be based on a binary change. So transition year, but we also have a continuous measure where we uh, look at this continuous measure from one to 4.3. And we show that uh, when transition progresses, if you're born at the time of major change in transition in indicators, that's uh, going to be painful for you. So our, this is our main regression. So we look at height or happiness, and the coefficient of interest will be beta, which is uh, born in transition of individual I in country C. And uh, born in transition equals one. If individual one was born or one year old or two years old when transition started, uh, started in country C. And we control for a lot of individual characteristics. We control for country specific trends. We control for country fixed effects. Uh, we control for country characteristics at the year of birth, for example, GDP. So GDP decline will be part of our regressions. War in a country, which unfortunately was the case for many countries in our uh, data set will also be part, part of the story. So this is the main regression. So I, I, uh, this is a typical economics table. I'm not sure to what extent it's easy to read for non-economists, but I'm sure it's, it's not that hard. So we control for lots of stuff, but here I only report, uh, I only report uh, coefficients that uh, born in transition, also GDP and also country at war. So this is uh, the regression you may uh, want to remember. So if you're born during transition, controlling for everything else, you're one centimeter shorter. This is minus one means one centimeter shorter. Uh, if you are uh, born or one year old, you're still one centimeter shorter. If you're, if you're born one or two year old at the time of transition, the coefficient goes down to something like 0.6. And uh, this, is, this is what you could see in, in this chart of detrended uh, uh, de uh, height. I'm trying to see, yeah, this, this particular chart, which I showed you, minus two years old, the coefficient is one and a half, but uh, uh, zero or minus one, the coefficient is close to one, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, this is the result. Now we also control if country was at war where you were born and mostly it's Yugoslavia, but it's also Moldova or Georgia and so on. And uh, war hurts your height as well. So if you're born during the war, you're more likely to be half a centimeter short. This, uh, these wars were not uh, the total wars, right? There were limited wars. And so it's a half a centimeter. So transition in this case is more painful for your socioeconomic conditions when you were born uh, than uh, civil conflict uh, in those countries. Uh, we also control for GDP and being born in a higher GDP country is good for you. Right, and we control for country fixed effects. So uh, it's a change of GDP within a country. This is how you understand it. It's, it's a log. So if GDP goes up by 10 percentage points, 
your height will be 0.06 centimeters higher. And uh, you see when we include GDP, for example, war becomes insignificant. That means that the impact of the war was mediated by impact of GDP. So war drives uh, decline in GDP. And once you control for decline in GDP, the war itself becomes insignificant. But height remains significant and coefficient becomes just a little bit smaller. So it's not just GDP, it's also decline in quality of public goods, uh, also the general deprivation and probably also inequality, which shoots up, which hits uh, most vulnerable households. So even if you control for GDP, nothing, nothing changes. Okay. So we run lots of robustness effects. So we run a regression for people at 21 plus or 18 plus years of age at the time of the survey. We also drop comparative countries or include comparator countries. We also will classify, reclassify East Germany as transition country or non-transition. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a hard question because East Germany was a transition country, but since it was integrated into West Germany, that was a completely different experience, right? Uh, we also include, as I mentioned, continuous indicators uh, of reform rather than zero one indicator of transition uh, started when you were born. Uh, we also control for infant mortality that shrinks the data set, but we show that infant mortality measures are important. So infant mortality is a good measure of a public goods quality. So we show that infant mortality goes up. Um, uh, uh, you are more likely to grow shorter but coefficients remain significant, even you, if you control for infant mortality. Coefficients have been born in transition. So we run a number of placebos. So we look at people born four to six years before transition or people born after transition, we find no effect. We also look at two specific effects, two specific events. So we say, what if you're born in 89? Or what if you're born in 91? And we find no effect. So one thing which we did, Referid asked us to look at what if you're born in World War II. Now that gives you also one centimeter. Now this is of course a lower bound of the effect. Why? Because if you survive, if you're born during World War II and you survive until 2016, you must be very resilient. You must be on a kind of uh, tougher part of that particular generation. And uh, so probably the impact of World War II was much more painful. However, for those people who survived, people who were born in World War II, relative to the trend of people born before and after World War II, people who were born in World War II were one centimeter shorter. So comparable to the impact of being born in transition. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a huge effect. Right? So, uh, one of the things we also did, we looked at what happens if you look at born after transition. And you see that in addition to being born during transition, it's painful, but you, if you're born after transition, you're also a bit shorter than the trend, but this is explained by GDP dynamics. So once you control for GDP, these coefficients become insignificant. And so uh, being born after a transition was not easy as well, but if your GDP recovered, after transition, then it was no income on your height. So that was something to think about as well. Okay, so heterogeneity, we looked at countries by uh, their level of income and we show that the whole effect is driven by poorer half of the sample. It's also driven by former Soviet Union. These things of course are highly correlated. Um, Central and Eastern Europe, you don't really find the effect. Uh, the effect in the poorer part of the sample is very, very robust. It's actually uh, uh, surviving when you include fixed effect for birth year cohorts. So people born in the same year, but uh, facing transition at different age would uh, have uh, significant results of being born in transition growing up shorter. Okay. There is no impact on inequality of heights within country. We find nothing like that. And there is no heterogeneity of place of birth, rural, urban, or gender. This is something we don't find. So uh, this is completely intuitive, the fact that we find effects in the poorer sample, half of the sample, because when, you're, when you have higher income, you already are unlikely to have a lot of impact uh, of deprivation on height. In rich countries, 
the, the impact on height is very limited. Quickly, I should tell you that, sorry, uh, we also have uh, found impact on weight. So people who were born in transition are today uh, 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 having a lower weight, but this is not something to be scared of because it's mostly about uh, probability of being overweight being lower. So these people, when they grow up to the age of 18 or 21, these people are actually doing better in general in terms of not being overweight. And the impact is actually quite large, seven percentage points on probability of being uh, overweight. So it's part of the story that people who were born in transition today are not uh, that hurt. And this is what we find when we look at life satisfaction. So when you look at life satisfaction, this is life satisfaction on one to five scale. And uh, basically we find a pretty large impact of being born in transition. And this impact is positive. Even when you control for GDP per capita, when you're born, uh, effects remain significant and, and, and substantial. So this is something like, uh, uh, 10% or even more of um, one standard deviation of happiness within country. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge impact. So, okay. Now, uh, why we compare people born in transition with uh, people born before and after, and we find no evidence that they have higher or lower income. They, we have no, no difference in terms of employment or unemployment, but we have impact on education. So what happened in those countries uh, in 1990s was deregulation of education. The enrollment in tertiary education drastically increased. For example, in Russia, uh, the number of students increased by a factor of two or even two and a half. And today, uh, Russia is one of the countries with the highest proportion of people with tertiary education in the world. So, uh, so that was actually good news for this cohort. And so we shouldn't be surprised that those people who were born during transition, yes, when they were born, life was tough. But then when they were growing up, they actually get more opportunities to get education and they became happier. Now, when you look at their at, at their peers who were um, um, in their formative years at the start of transition, you see that these people are unhappy. So these uh, people are the ones who saw the uh, turbulent years when they were most impressionate. However, they still believe that democracy is good. They also believe that market economy is good, but, uh, but this is not significant. Uh, other other attitudes we see pretty much no, no impact. Why they believe in democracy? Probably they were told when they were 18 or 20 that democracy is good. Still, they're less happy today because they also remember the pain of 1990s, we guess. But as you see, lots of those results are in, in, in uh, significance. So I won't really make uh, much um, of those results. Now, one thing I would mention about happiness is you would say, okay, these people are, who are born in transition are happier than people who are born before and after. And they're more educated than people born before and after. So why people born after transition are less happy and less educated? Well, the answer is people born after transition are still in school. So they're still less educated because they're still in school by the year of 2016 when we run the survey. So this is an open question for the survey and it's still still uh, too early to judge those people, okay? So finally, um, still have uh, five minutes or so, uh, let me tell you about Russia. So in Russia, there is a panel where we can actually observe height, not just of kids, but also of parents. We can also look at kids of different ages and compare them to kids of the same age, say in America and measure, measure at which age uh, the transition hits them. And we also look at different siblings within families. We can look at a brother and sister born to the same parents. Brother, uh, one sibling is born during transition. One is born out before and after transition. And we can compare that. And we also match an observable maternal characteristics to see if different women decided to give birth during transition. And to quickly say that, I should say that we don't really 
observe big differences between women who decides to give birth during transition before and after. Uh, women who gave birth during transition are a bit younger, but otherwise there is no significant difference. Now, this is um, the regression where we control for maternal height. And so we look at, uh, in order to have a large sample, we look at uh, kids of all ages, uh, not just adults, because in, otherwise the sample would be too small. And um, uh, we then compare, say, a 10-year-old to a 10-year-old in America. We look at what's called Z-score, height for age, Z-scores from America, that allows us to calculate the implied height effect for boys and girls using American distribution of people with the same age. And so we show that even when you control for maternal height, um, girls and boys were hit quite badly by being born in transition by one centimeter or even two centimeters, depending how you, how you look. And this is a, this is a huge, huge number. So uh, just to tell you on the left side, we again, look at uh, centimeters and centimeters are similar to what we find from the other data set. It's a one centimeter result in some cases, one and a half. Uh, on the right hand side, the uh, coefficients are for height for age scores. So they are not in centimeters, but they are in standard deviations. Uh, centimeters are reported at the bottom of the table and they're one or two centimeters. So the magnitudes are compared. Now, what we also do, we run regression within family and we also find results and uh, results are negative. They're less uh, significant and sometimes not significant when we look for a linear trend but if we don't include country specific trend, then the coefficients are significant. So people born within the same family during transition are shorter than their siblings uh, born um, after or before transition. Now life satisfaction results are actually similar. So life, uh, uh, they're less, less significant because the data, the number of people born in transition, this data set is smaller but still at least they, they show they go in the same direction. Now, let me uh, conclude since uh, it's been almost 45 minutes. So what we find here is first and foremost, begin of transition was time of significant hardship. Now, uh, some people would say, aha, reforms caused hardship. Now we cannot say that this is a descriptive paper. Uh, what we can say is people who were born in transition are shorter. So their families were going through significant deprivation. That is something I can say for sure. Now, does that mean that transition reforms caused hardship or hardship caused the beginning of the reforms because people said, we cannot tolerate this, we need reform. However painful reforms are, we really need the reforms because we have nothing to... Uh, we have no food to feed our kids with, and we have to queue for hours. So this is impossible to uh, tolerate. So these things we cannot distinguish between. Now, in the public opinion, in most of these countries, people think that transition report, uh, reforms caused hardship. But actually, for example, in Soviet Union, GDP decline started before the reforms, and it was the complete collapse of governance system and of the economy that brought uh, in the reform government because uh, Soviet government couldn't just run the country anymore. GDP, sorry, budget deficit was 30% of GDP and GDP decline was already quite, hard, quite big. So it's very hard to differentiate those, uh, uh, those stories. Now, uh, the journal economic policy that I mentioned is unlike uh, many other journals, is happy to publish descriptive papers if they document important policy relevant findings. And that's why we're very happy this journal uh, accepted this paper. But this paper tells you something, but it doesn't really tell you whether it's one or two, whether transition causes deprivation or deprivation causes beginning of reforms. Now, one centimeter result, as I mentioned, is huge. And uh, this is something which is very, very important. But on the other hand, does that mean that transition was a failure? The answer is no. Whatever people believe, people who are born in transition are actually happier today. And it is because they're better educated. 
So opportunities were greater for people who are younger. And uh, once again, I should warn you that when we say that people who are born in transition are happier than people who are born before and after, there I think people who are born after, they're too early to judge because they're still in school. So they will complete their education. And I think it is important to rerun this exercise now or in five years and to see if people who were born after transition are even happier. So it's, a, it's an open question. But that's definitely true that you cannot say, well, these people were born in transition, hit by this uh, deprivation and forever are shorter and unhappy and unaccomplished. This is wrong. They're shorter, but they're happy. Now, people who, are, who were in their formative years during transition are today more supportive of democracy, but less happy. So that was wrong time to be in your formative years uh, because it was actually a substantial hardship. So let me conclude here and see if there are questions. So let me, let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Sergei, for this, uh, this very interesting presentation. And I think the fact that nobody interrupted you is testimony to the fact that it was actually very easy to follow and um, even for the non-specialists present here. So thank you very much. Um, as I said before, if you want to ask a question, put a plus in the chat and I can see that this is already happening. So um, let's start right away with the first question by Anastasia Schacht, please. Thank you, Yanis, and thank you, Sergei, for this wonderful talk. It was both insightful and entertaining, and that was kind of great, really, really nice. Um, I have a bunch of questions that are probably nonsensical, because most of them rely to the counting. Um, the first of it would be, mm, where is the impact of the anti-alcoholic campaign in the mid-80s? I presume it was uncalculated just because it's not in the same window frame or was there no impact upon the height? The second thing is the weight parameters. If I remember correctly, and this is where I can really be wrong, I just remember um, this post-Soviet encyclopedia on medicine by my parents and the nutrition parameters prescribed for like the healthy lifestyle were counted in a very different way than what we do here in the West, which means I remember something like the normal advice amount of nutritive per day would be something 1,500 calories, which means it is very different amount to refer to, which means most of the children uh, would be calculated to be undernourished in a very different way. So do you have any uh, correspondence in the data there. And finally, um, how would you comment on this better accessibility of education, a passionary education for sure, but within the general tendency of the educational politics of the Soviet Union? Yes. So starting with the 60s, I presume this educational boost. And uh, I could also read this um, hype for higher education in the post transformed, post communist society is a continuation of a tendency towards better education that started like a generation or two generations previously to that. So that is, I suppose, everything by now. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Anastasia. So these are three great questions on anti-alcohol campaign. So we cannot really pin, pinpoint it. Uh, um, we can, of course, try to see if people born in late 80s are taller or shorter. And uh, in principle, uh, uh, this, this chart kind of tells you that this is kind of the anti-alcohol campaign kids, and these are the transition kids. So some, uh, you can say that in Soviet countries, anti-alcohol campaign was removed in uh, exactly at the time of the transition. So uh, in okay. principle, what you can say is our results are driven mostly by post-Soviet countries. And we mm -hmm. claim that it's because of price liberalization, but you can also say it's because of removal of anti-alcohol campaign. So this is a great criticism. Nobody actually raised this question to us before, even though I've presented that many, many times. And um, so it's a, great, it's a great question. 
Now, I can tell you though, since we are in an interdisciplinary audience that there are studies of anti-alcohol campaign and there is a paper by uh, Gutman, Miller and Bhattacharya, I think, in American Economic Journal Applied Economics 2013 and some other papers by the New Economic School professor uh, Evgeny Yakovlev that look on those, at those issues and they show that anti-alcohol campaign saved a lot of lives. When it was stopped, these people died. And so basically, when we talk about excess mortality, when we talk about rise in mortality in 1990s in Russia, we're talking about excess mortality of something like 2 million people. Out of this, one and a half million can be explained by the removal of anti-alcohol campaign. So this is a huge, huge impact. And so what you're asking about is a very important policy issue that is under discussed, I would say. I won't say it's understudied. Now, scholars have done a great job. The demographer um, Vladimir Shkolnikov documented that already in 1990s, and economists, as I said, did it a bit later. And um, we know now pretty much everything that, uh, that uh, this campaign has saved lives. And then when it was removed, these people just died. And, um, and this is what drove the majority of this life expectancy crisis and mortality crisis that people attribute to the reforms. This particular reform, removal of anti-alcohol campaign caused majority of the mortality increase. Now today, as you know, we have deaths of despair in the US. So this mortality crisis in 1990s in Russia and Ukraine now is being replayed in the US in the last 20 or 30 years, there is a book by Case and Didon, uh, being a Nobel Prize winner, Angus Didon, called Deaths of Despair and people who lose their jobs in uh, lower middle class, mostly white Americans, uh, have addiction issues, opioids, alcohol, drugs, commit suicides. And so in that sense, we kind of have a replay of that in America today. And America today stands out as the only developed country, which now is going through stagnation of life expectancy and increase in middle age mortality among certain categories during a peaceful time. We've seen that in transition countries, 1990s. Now we see that in America, it's once again, an example where you can learn from the East and uh, see the problems re uh, replayed in the West. Now your second question was about the weight. So uh, uh, I would say that um, uh, again, this is something that I don't know much about. I would say that uh, we looked at various data on what uh, on prices for meat, availability of meat, production by meat of meat within Soviet regions, and we saw that Soviet diet was very unhealthy in a sense that people would not get lots of proteins and so on. It was underproduction of uh, good food and overproduction of bad food. But uh, I, I don't have those slides with me right now. So one of the things I would mention, and this is related to height. So this is something that I know better. So if you ask a question about living standards in Soviet Union, you would see that living standards were rising if you measure it by height. They were uh, rising after World War II until early 70s. Uh, and so if you look at boys born in 50s, 60s, in the uh, 70s and 80s, there is a paper by Elizabeth Brainerd from Brandeis. So she shows that boys born in Moscow were the same height as boys born in the United States until 70s. And they were increasing trends in both places, right? Uh, and Moscow was not representative of, of um, uh, Soviet Union, it was privileged still. And then starting 70s, American boys becoming taller and taller, Moscow boys becoming actually shorter. So I was born in 1971. I am the tallest uh, Soviet generation. So, uh, so this economic stagnation of 1970s was actually accompanied by decline in living standards. And I would say that that should be correlated to the question you asked about nutrition. So probably uh, once you don't have proteins, you tell kids that you don't need proteins. So, <laughs> and that's, that's what it is. Precisely. Now on education. So education, education 
is a great question. So Soviet ideology was to educate everybody, including women. And yet today you can see the difference between East and West Germany that East German women are better educated and have higher labor force participation because Soviet ideology was to make sure that everybody works and produces weapons. So we win the Cold War and Cold War if need be. And, uh, and in that case, in that case uh, you see a lot of expansion of higher education, as you mentioned. So Soviet Union was better educated than countries with the same level of income. And Soviet Union was a middle income country, right? It was not a high income country, but it was 100% literate, like the West, even though the West was much richer. And yet, post Soviet Russia or post Soviet transition countries were even better educated. This huge expansion in the 1990s was deregulation. So, so uh, post Soviet government said, you want to educate, go and educate. You want to buy a degree, you go and buy a degree. And so, and so as I said, we are now talking about 80% of high school cohorts going into university. In Soviet times, it would be 20 or 30%. So it's a huge expansion. And today, as I mentioned, if you look at years of higher education per capita, Russia is a top country in the world or top three countries in the world, depending on how you come. If you look at higher education, people with higher education in the labor force, Russia is a top country in the world or top three country in the world uh, at par with Korea and Canada. So Russia, is a very educated country. Even if you control for quality, uh, Russia, uh, there, are, there are measures in the World Bank, the World Bank Human Capital Project controls for quality. If you adjust for quality, Russia is still as educated as uh, developed countries. A little bit below Singapore, but at par with Western Europe. So, so it's a huge expansion. So Soviet Union was educated people, but even Russia has educated, post-Soviet Russia educated much more people, many more people. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions and the answers. So we continue joining us from Berlin. Tobias Ruprecht, please. Hello, everyone. Fantastic paper. I enjoyed this a lot. Uh, you give a whole new meaning to the commanding heights of the economy here. Uh, I have a question concerning the, uh, the use of um, 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 Tobes, uh, you're muted. Something happened to Tobes, I guess. Yeah. Something's something's off. Something, some emergency happened, I guess. Maybe we take the next question and come back. Mm. Okay, now he froze. Okay, so we'll um we'll keep. We'll keep the question in mind, and in the meantime, we will continue with uh, Julia Bavouze, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Govia, for this very interesting talk. My question would be a very short one and detailed one. In most of the parameters that you've calculated, there is somehow a difference between men and women, or boys and girls. And I just wanted you please to explain maybe why, why this negative impact seems to be somehow smoothened for, for women. So that would be the question. So Julia, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. First and foremost, women are shorter. Um, uh, so um, you, can, you, can, you can see on this chart, this is normal. It's true in all countries. It's like eight or nine centimeter difference. Um, why uh, this impact is not as abrupt, uh, uh, we actually, when we run a regression, we don't see differences between genders. I mentioned that when I was talking about heterogeneity, um, there is no impact. Uh, so when we try to see the difference between men and women, we don't really see this difference. Uh, on this chart, yet you do see kind of a different story. Uh, but if you look at the overall trend, yes, it's also a one centimeter effect for men. 
So it's, uh, it's very hard to speculate and uh, uh, demographically, eventually uh, demographers say that what matters is a culture, whether women and men are uh, fed differently, taken care of differently by the parents. But as I already mentioned, uh, Soviet society was already, communist planning economy was already quite gender equal in the sense that women could not become directors of big enterprises, but they were supposed to get education at least. And, uh, and there was a gender pay gap, but still it's not a story of missing girls. It's not a story of underfed uh, uh, girls uh, in, a, in a way that you would see in developing countries. So we don't really see heterogeneity by by men and women. And uh, as I said, if you look at the trend here, you still see an impact on women. So it looked more abrupt, looks uh, more abrupt for men, but uh, overall, once we run a regression, I don't have the slide with me, but there is actually a table in the, in the paper which looks at the heterogeneity by gender and we don't find, we don't find it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I was just uh, I was just communicating with uh, Tobias Ruprecht via phone. His internet broke down. Um, so in the meantime, we um, shall continue with uh, Philip, please. Philip Thier. Hello. Well, uh, thanks as well for this fascinating paper. And um, I think it was a very good example. You know what what one can do um, in uh, quantitative uh research and you know i was really impressed how you know you put in different variables and even that up and took into account uh, so many things um, um one little comment about you know the early 90s the material out of my own research experience uh, for my uh 2000 well english in, in english was 2019 i know sorry 16 book um this you know the new order on the old continent i wanted to know um how poor poles really were in 1990 and uh before 95 no eurostat statistics uh oecd virtually nothing so it was really difficult i found um some statistics by the way in the vienna institute for um, international economics so the, the WIIW, they have anyhow the best statistics I've ever found compared to OECD and other places. And, uh, but anyway, then, you know, early 90s was really difficult. And then I found something in the statistical yearbook in Poland, they registered how much people had spent on food of their monthly income. And I thought that was a pretty good indicator. But I only could find that by digging up um, old statistical yearbooks in print, um, not to be found in the internet. So it was kind of, you know, the, the archive, archival digging. Um, and then the result was really interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, amount for food was almost 60%, um, more than clearly more than half, um, you know, if converted into black market dollars, you could see how poor people really were. Um, and then, you know, one could compare 92, 95, and it was clear, ah, okay, things are changing quickly to the better. However, that is, of course, a well-known story. Um, less well-known is the story how poor people really were at the end of um, state, uh, state socialism. Um, so maybe, you know, these old printed statistical journals have similar statistics about other countries, but I don't know. I did only Poland because I couldn't do everything. I didn't have such a great team you're having. Uh, so compliments again. Yeah. Um, now, my question is um, about, I have a two. One is uh, about materials or, you know, indicators being used. Um, you mentioned it and, and um, also in your response, um, life expectancy. Uh, why do you prefer um, height? And so to say an anthropological measure to statistics in life expectancy. And, and you know, there, there's an abundance of them. Um, also going back to history, Angus Madison, uh, to the Western world. Um, so why why do you why do you prefer that? I, I'm 
it's a, it's a, a basic and maybe even a stupid question, but I, I wanted to ask it. Um, and uh, the second question is, um, well, the visibility of the shock, right? Isn't that an implicit, I mean, if you would compare that, let's say with Chinese statistics or, uh, well, even if actually, if you take Ukrainian ones, um, isn't that an argument for gradualism in a way? <laughs> you know, the anthropometrics, um, aren't they implicitly an argument to avoid the shock, the radical reform and to go after this, you know, something more uh, gradual. Um, and, and now I have a third one. I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't want to take up all the time. You know, please pick and select. Third one is, um, in, in East Central Europe, um, well, the quality of school education, you know, elementary school and middle school, um, quite a few people claim that it has not risen and it has gone down because of low salary for teachers, good teachers moving to other jobs. Um, can you confirm that? Right, uh, Philip, uh, very, very, very good questions. And um, uh, I, will, I will actually look up your book uh, about, about share of uh, food in, in spending. Uh, I don't think that would be valuable in Soviet Union exactly because it shows uh, something really bad about Soviet living standards. And, uh, and on top of that, uh, what did happen in the late 80s in Soviet Union the share of spending on food would be low, but the share of time you spend on getting the food in queues would be high. And as a, as a person who, who came, uh, who was born in 71, I can tell you that one year in Moscow, you couldn't get any cheese. So it was just, uh, there was one shop that would sell cheese and that would be one kilometer line to buy the cheese. And so for one year, I didn't eat any cheese. And that was the great capital of the great Soviet Union. I think it was 1989 or 1990. So, and, uh, and uh, if, you get, if you did spend time in, in line, the cheese would be cheap. So it wouldn't be a high share of your income, <laughs> but it just, it just, I couldn't get any cheese <laughs> anyway. Uh, and uh, in, that sense, in that sense, it's very hard to use this, this statistic. I'm sure it's very hard to get it. Um, already in 1980s, uh, sociologists started to run polls. So maybe some polls, not official statistics, but polls would be, independent polls would be sort of, um, possible to find and, and indeed track it down. So overall, I think it's a great, the, the great suggestion. Now I, I put this slide on because you mentioned Poland and Poland is something that, uh, Poland is a country which had the same, so Poland starts here and jumps here. So Poland is a country which, uh, started off at the same income per capita level as Ukraine. And Ukraine today has the same income per capita, slightly lower actually. And Poland has double or even two and a half times more uh, income per capita than it had uh, 30 years ago. So this is something that tells you a story of two countries. And whenever people talk about Ukraine, they always talk about Poland and compare the two. And so it's, it's fascinating how poor Poland was in early 1990s or big, uh, late 1980s, it was as poor as Ukraine today. And today it's a high income country with all political problems in Poland. It's a great economic success. And uh, it's, it's amazing how much you can accomplish. And part of that was of course a EU obsession. Now, your last question is about education, about quality of education. So um, I can, I can say that on average quality of education in post-communist countries came down. Uh, quality of education in top schools probably improved, but since there was a, such a huge quantitative expansion, the average qu uh, quality has come down. And uh, yet you still have huge returns. You have huge returns to education. So if you go to a tertiary education institution today, you, your wage will still be whatever, 10% higher per year. So uh, per year of higher education. So it's still, uh, even this low quality really pays off. So that's why Russians still go to uh, higher education because they know it pays off. Without higher education, you cannot really get a good job. 
sometimes with higher education, you, you don't get a good job. So the people who are deliver, working in delivery with a higher education diploma, a diploma, but still, uh, this, is, this is a social norm to get a university diploma today. Now, one thing on uh, uh, middle education in secondary education, my co-authors in my, my colleagues in the BRD have done one interesting study on Estonia. So what Estonia did, they borrowed Finnish model and Finnish uh, secondary education is one of the best in the world. So Estonia said, uh, let's reform our education system and borrow uh, education system from Finland. So they did that. And initially they did it for Estonian language schools and only later for Russian language schools. And so you have this uh, difference in difference uh, opportunity. And so my co-authors published a paper that shows that reform of education in Estonia really delivered for people who studied in Estonian reformed schools are now better off. And you can say that there are many problems with comparing Estonian language, Russian language and so on, but curriculum reform in Estonia really delivered. And Estonia is not just by accident, a well-governed, high-income, and IT savvy country. It's also because they borrowed so much from Finnish education system. And so in Estonia, I would say uh, secondary education has actually improved. So um, you also asked uh, uh, other questions. Can you remind me the question? So it's, uh, the, yeah. Yes, yes, but, but please save time for other people who ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the question was very simple. Um, a height entrepreneurial uh, versus anthropo life expectancy. Uh, measure versus uh, life expectancy. So this is a very easy question. So uh, life expectancy you can measure only by country, right? So country year. Uh, what we are doing, this is something that you can measure at the level of individual. So we cannot really, I can tell you a story that life expectancy in early 1990s went up. Uh, so it went down, sorry, went down. Mortality went up, life expectancy went down. When uh, life expectancy went down. This is something I can tell you. I can even tell you the story of um, anti-alcohol reform, but I cannot tell you the story by cohorts. And uh, in uh, 50 years, I guess, I can tell you a story of life um, uh, of, uh, of uh, mortality of people born around transition. They're still mostly alive. But in 50 years, I can tell you that people born uh, during transition lived longer or shorter than people born before and after transition. This is something I will be able to tell you later. But today I cannot still tell you. I can tell you that these people are shorter but happier. And that's already enough for me actually to uh, to speculate. Let's go back uh, to this question in 50 years and see if I, I'm right, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be right. People born during transition will live longer than people born before them. But I can also speculate that people born after transition will live even longer because they will be better educated and so on and so forth. But uh, if you think about traditional life expectancy at birth, this measure is country year measure and it's not as disaggregated. And so this is why this is why we wanted to do something else. We wanted to look at height. So this is what we did. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe the, the, the other question that Philip had about gradualism or shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Then, yeah. uh, I mean, maybe we can keep that for the, for the end because I think that's a very fundamental question that would mm -hmm. actually top off this discussion very well. And now we will have another go with Tobias Ruprecht, whose internet is hopefully working now. Uh, Tobias, you want to give it another go? Okay, no? I'll try yeah. again. I hope this works now. Um, I wanted to ask why you chose price liberalization as your indicator for transition. Uh, you mentioned yourself, especially in a Soviet case, the economic collapse predated uh, the price liberalization by uh, one or two years. Privatization was a matter mostly of, of the later years in the 1990s. So why do you think, why did you choose price liberalization as your indicator? And perhaps this ties in a bit uh, with the discussion now on the gradual and shock therapy approaches. If you focus on price liberalization, you kind of suggest that it is price liberalization that causes people to, you know, not to shrink, but not to grow to the same height. Uh, one could argue that you deliver arguments for those who criticize uh, uh, Chuba East and Gaidar for uh, inflicting all these horrible things on the Russian population, uh, which is probably not what you, what you had in mind. So I'd be curious to hear why price liberalization. Thank you. 
Excellent, excellent, Tobias, and indeed it's related to Philip's question on gradualism. So um, I fully agree with you that there are different ways to measure it. We wanted a single year because we wanted to pinpoint this impact on people being born in this year or being one or two years old. So we cannot really have a five-year period because otherwise we won't find any results. And um, price liberalization has this property. And in all countries, we were able to find this year and uh, as I mentioned, in the BRD, you have these transition indicators. We don't collect this data anymore because, uh, because of various reasons. I'm happy to talk about this because reforms have started to stagnate after 2014, basically. And uh, yet, in 1990s, this data set was used by everybody. So EBRD has tracked reform progress with EBRD transition indicators. And uh, these were from one to four. And basically, the... Uh, one means prices are all controlled, the four or 4.3 means all prices are free. And for each country, we we're able to find the two point shift. So going from one to three or from 1.3 to 3.3, something like this, or going from one to four. So for every country in this region, there was a shock therapy. In some countries, the shock started in 95. Yet you had this, uh, you had this year. And as I mentioned, we could actually do that for a continuous indicator and see that the shock of increase in price liberalization score and price liberalization transition indicator is also bad for your height. Or actually the shock of average increase in six transition indicators. And six transition indicators include price liberalization, um, uh, large scale privatization, small scale privatization. So in principle, you can actually find results on privatization in our paper. And this average uh, uh, indicator of all transition indicators, uh, we can also show that it, it, it is, it is uh, bad for height. Now, overall, if I just wanted to find the beginning of privatization, that would be problematic. So there is no binary variable because privatizations were long in some countries in some countries, they were short. Uh, so it's very hard to compare privatization in Poland and privatization in Russia. So in that sense, in that sense uh, it would be very hard. Um, so uh, you rightly said that in Soviet Union, price uh, output decline started before price liberalization. That's what I mentioned a couple of times. I think Soviet government did not have a choice uh, of gradual reforms. I actually highly recommend a book by Chris Miller called uh, The Struggle to Save uh, Soviet Economy. The book was published in 2016. I wrote a review essay for this book on this book in 2019 for Journal of Economic Literature. And as like in all uh, gel reviews, you get an opportunity not just to review the book, but also offer your own views. And so uh, I highly recommend my review essay as well. But basically this book tells you a story how Gorbachev was looking at Chinese experience. He tried to think, can we do something like in China? And if you think that Gorbachev didn't try, that would be a mistake. Gorbachev did try and he failed because they were powerful interest groups. They opposed the gradual reform. Uh, and Gorbachev was not in control of the country to the extent that the Deng Xiaoping was. Um, the initial conditions were different. And so Gorbachev was, was aware of the reforms in China and he tried and he failed. And uh, by the time uh, of 1991, economy is falling apart. Uh, Gorbachev's government is incompetent. I should say that too. So when I looked at uh, their economic uh, governance, uh, they had no clue how to manage an economy. And this is what Gaidar writes in his book, Collapse of an Empire. And so there was no choice but to do shock therapy. Uh, pretty much it was not choke therapy at all. It's just, it just uh, Gaidar government said, we no longer control anything. So let, let prices go. Because if we try to continue Gorbachev policies, there'll be no money in the budget and no uh, products in the, uh, in, the show, uh, in, the, in the shops. And so they just let go. Now, one of the things which happened, which, Gar which Gaidar government didn't do, Gaidar government didn't explain that also, all these uh, deposits in banks uh, were raided by Soviet government. So it was already too late to think about uh, how we compensate the 
uh, bank deposits. And uh, you could still compensate it in a different way. And I can talk about this, but the country was truly bankrupt. So as I mentioned, 1991, the budget deficit was 30% of GDP and uh, nobody would lend to Soviet government. So there was no, no choice. But uh, answering your question and Philip's question, Gorbachev in his last years looked at the West, looked at the East. He saw that Central and Eastern Europe did not present a viable alternative. Stagnation already started in Central and Eastern Europe. All the experiments in Yugoslavia and Hungary didn't really pay off. And uh, so he looked at it at the, in the East. He traveled to China. He actually traveled first, first state visit in many decades from a Soviet leader to China. Took place a couple of weeks before Tiananmen disaster. He was supposed to speak at Tiananmen Square, but students already occupied it. So he actually spoke at the airport. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting to see how he thought about those issues, but he couldn't do anything because uh, the system was already unreformable. It was too late to reform because uh, the uh, interest groups were defense industry, energy industry, agricultural lobby. They said no reform, thank you very much. So, and Gorbachev was not in control, party was falling apart, so it was too late. Okay, thank you um, for covering two questions um, in one. Now, um, we're running a bit short on time, but questions are coming in now. So I guess what we will do is we will take three questions now um, together and then um, you can answer them all at once. Um, I will start um, with my own question first. Um, I was quite intrigued by what you showed about um, the, the cohort that lived through transition during their formative years, that they are unhappier, but it doesn't really have political implications in your sample. You say they, they even support democracy and all the other stuff is insignificant. So my question would be what drives the populist backlash then, which is kind of happening everywhere. And the question would be what, What's going on there? Is this a generational thing? Is it the even older people who drive this? Or what would be your take on this? Um, so that would be my question. Let's continue with uh, Lukas Becht. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a short question opening it up a, a bit to the contemporary situation. And, um, and you made this uh, very convincing um, uh, correlation clear between, between painful experiences of liminality or transition of economic crisis and uh, um, body hate. And I just wondered if you could comment on whether you, will, if you would expect that the current pandemic is also such a moment or a period of transition or crisis which will have uh, such an impact on on, on, on body measures, but also on well-being in the, in the longer term. And you will be able to find that later on in the statistics. Okay, thank you, Lukas. And last but not least, uh, Nino Ibazishvili, please. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. I have no question, I have two comments. Maybe I wait with this and after uh, questions, after answers, I do then my best to be short. Uh, maybe maybe say it now because then we can then Sergey can can answer and then we can wrap it up. So. Okay, okay. So uh, first of all, maybe I can somehow um, offer not total but uh, partial explanation um, about this uh, educational issue in nineties. I mean, uh, growing up without electricity, all this TV and. Uh, internet uh, besides waiting uh, bread or water what else can one do if uh, um, children are somehow interesting in something so i i remember in my generation we played a lot of chess and uh, uh, read books so and it was kind of motivation um because it was kind of only thing to get out not only to stay there but get out of this out of this situation, this first comment. And second one, I'm not really convinced with this happiness because looking at Georgian citizens, I'm not sure if, if they are happy. Maybe uh, a lot of these happier people are out migrated now from this total four millions, one point million, they are out and um, 
this is another issue. If we this out migrated in north uh, global north uh, are happy, this is another question. <laughs> so I'm 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 not sure. Maybe it's just about people are glad that this horrible all these horrible things are, are not anymore everyday life. So. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Going in the opposite directions from Nino's uh, questions. Uh, yes, it's, uh, Georgia was a failed state uh, up until early 2000s, or even uh, mid 2000s, right? And uh, this is quite unique. So you also have countries which went through civil war. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, one of the things which happened to Georgia is many left. And we, if a Georgian goes to Germany or Russia, it may be uh, he or she may become part of our survey and will trace back the place of birth. So a Georgian living in Russia today, being part of life and transition survey, will be surveyed and will uh, look at uh, the situation in Georgia at time of birth. So that is, in that sense, maybe indeed, happier Georgians are the ones who left <laughs> and uh, we captured them in Russia or Germany or Italy, who knows. So I, 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 agree, I agree with that uh, comment. Now, uh, talking, uh, talking about this question about, uh, um, about uh, the backlash and generational thing, I put on this slide where I, I uh, embarrassingly made a typo in the year of Gurif and Jurafska. So it's a Gurif and Jurafska 2009 Journal of Economic Perspective paper called uh, unhappiness in transition. And so there we show a very important fact. I'm not sure how many people study happiness here, but in happiness, there is a very important observation. It's a U-shaped uh, happiness age relationship. When you're 18, you're very happy. Then with age, your happiness goes down until middle age, 40 or 50 years old. And then it starts going up again. So for a lot of young people in the audience, uh, when you are my age, you'll be happy again. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then by the time you're 80, you're as happy as you were when you were 18, right? So this U-shaped relationship is observed in most countries, but not in transition countries. We show with uh, Ekaterina Zhuravsky in our paper that young people in transition are as happy as uh, young people in non-transition countries controlling for income. Older people are much less happy. And actually, in 2009, looking at different data sets from transition countries, we showed that there is a monotonic negative relationship. There is no U-shape. So older people in transition countries are just very unhappy. And uh, answering Yanni's question, why? Well, they remember free education. They remember public goods. They faced low pensions in 1990s. So it's, it's a... Uh, it's really a different, different story. And so this is a generational thing. And uh, in that sense, in that sense, uh, this is something we show in, in Gurif and Jurafska 2009. And then we show in 2018 update that in the last 10 years, things have changed in the sense that older people who remember Soviet Union are very few now. And so then you start seeing the U-shape again. And so it's, it's actually transition, transition is over in this sense by now. So then answering Lucas's question about 2020. So I think it's related to Yanni's question in the sense that um, there was a backlash, populist backlash in 2010, 11, 12 in Europe, which resulted in Brexit and Marine Le Pen and Trump. And part of that was about mistakes made during the great global financial crisis. The governments, some governments went into austerity, saved money. That created a lot of people who were left behind and started to vote for populist parties. So Russia didn't, that, didn't make that mistake. In 2009, Russia actually supported households and incomes in 2009 slightly grew, even though the GDP went down by 8%, right? Because uh, Putin understood he has a rainy day fund he needs to use it so people are not unhappy as in 1990s. The Western Europe didn't learn that lesson and the Western Europe made a lot of mistakes. Hence populist backlash. Now, 2020 is a different story. Western Europe has learned the lesson from the global financial crisis and was extremely generous. And uh, this crisis, the COVID crisis in general, but when you think about this, this is a crisis that can hit the left behind the most because 
we are educated, we're sitting in our homes, we have computers, online uh, connection, we can work online, we are safe in terms of health, we are safe in terms of income, probably better educated people have savings. So for people who are on the other side of skills distribution, they're much harder hit, both health and wealth wise, they have no savings, they have to work in the streets, so they are in danger of uh, dying of COVID. So ex ante, this is a crisis that hits the left behinds, left behinds more. Yet, because of the government's generosity, which rolled out 10% of GDP, 20% of GDP packages, it's not going to happen, I think. So my prediction is this crisis is going to be different because the Western governments have learned lessons from uh, 10 years ago. And I'm, I'm very happy about this. I think this is something that economists studying populism and myself including would tell the governments to do. And I'm, 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 I'm really happy that Western governments did that. Now, what we are going to see is a disaster in India. And I think that will be a backlash against Modi. And I think rightly so, but uh, we'll see. In, in, in Russia, there is also going to be a backlash. So Putin, for some reason, decided not to help the population, even though he could. And this, I think, is the biggest puzzle, why Putin didn't spend money in 2020 to help people. But what he saw was a historical decline in approval ratings. April and May 2020, uh, 2000 ratings were below 60. That's the first time in history. And much lower than 90 that he observed during Crimean annexation. And even now they came up a little bit after he really repressed the opposition. Um, uh, but still, he's suffering a big political backlash because he didn't spend money in 2020. And so I, I'm not sure why. I have my guesses, but I guess it's, it's beyond this seminar. But overall, the answer is 2020 in the West, it was good that the government rolled out a big generous financial support and I hope it will actually help uh, to support political equilibrium.